the most mature people in our church handle our children because most of the time they're the ones that have they've been through life experience and they're not going to teach them what an 18 year old would teach them they're going to take teach them what a 65 or a 70 year old would teach them and they're going to miss a lot of the garbage that that they can go through and that's that's basically uh, what I try to do with my granddaughter, and it's, it's working with her. Um, it's pretty interesting to talk to her about, about God. I called the other day, and I'm sure a lot of you, you know, had to deal with your kids going back to school this week, grandkids, whatever. So I called my granddaughter, and I said, on, on the night before school, I called her and I asked her, I said, would you like to pray? She said, no, I don't need to pray. And I said, are you sure? She said, no, I know God's going to take care of me. I said, okay, well, that's good. So next morning at about 7 o'clock, my phone rings. And I thought, hmm. So it was Michaela. And I thought, well, what do you want? And she said, uh, nothing. And I thought, well, what's going on? Nothing. And that's her favorite thing to say, you know, just nothing. And she just kind of hesitates. So I said, do you want to pray or something? And I thought, or something? So I said, well, you don't have to say anything if you don't want to. Okay, I love you. And I, so we prayed. And we just thank God for good friends, good teachers, just the simple things, you know. And then at the end, she says, amen, I love you, I got to go. And, uh, and I thought, so I talked to her yesterday. I just thought how neat it was to, to just to trust God in that area of friends and teachers. We've been doing that for a while now, and it seems to work out pretty good. She hasn't had Chris as a teacher yet, so it's been working out pretty good. Chris or Shannon. So Chris is mean. I guarantee it. I guarantee she's mean. So it's been working good, and, and it's, it's, we're trusting God, you know? So the next area that Kayla has been starting to talk about a little bit is, you know, and, and soon I'm going to need a car. <laughs> she's going to be 12. Soon, she's soon she's going to need a car. And I thought, I have to, I have to start teaching her about giving. And, and, and she knows a little bit about giving. But I really have to start teaching her about giving. And I need to teach her the way Paul taught us to give. And the reason, Matthew, are you rolling? Yeah, that's fine because I'm, I'm not paying attention. Yeah, you can edit. You're good at that stuff. Uh, so, you know, that's been on my mind a lot. I want my granddaughter to miss, miss the years of mistakes and actually jump right into the new covenant of grace and, and learn from Paul. Because Paul sets the standard for our giving. And people, people may or may not agree with that. But let's go to Galatians. Chris, will you go to Galatians? I think that's the first one, verse 8 and 9, starting at 8. A lot of people, and I, I'm one of them, I have a problem, a little problem with this verse right here. And I'm going to tell you why. It says, let, let God's curse fall. I, I'm going to take this verse, and I'm just going to change that word right there. And I'm going to use the word that the King James uses, accursed. And I'm going to tell you why I'm going to use that word. Because in, in, accursed kind of can mean the same thing as cursed. But it, there's, a, there's a meaning that the that the writer here is, is wanting you to see, and it's more along the lines of empowered to fail, okay? We know that Christ has redeemed us from each and every curse pronounced by the law, okay? So we first and foremost have to remember that we have been redeemed from any curse. That's the bottom line. There's no, there's, there's, there's nothing else to say about that, period. We have been redeemed from any curse. But I want to read this verse. It says, Let God's curse fall upon anyone, including us, or even an angel, from heaven, 
who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. Then he goes on to repeat the same thing in verse 9. I say again what we have said before. If anyone preaches another good news than the one you, than the one you welcomed, let that person be cursed. King James, most other versions say accursed. Empowered to fail. Paul is using that, that phrase, that empowered to fail, because he's literally talking about the good news versus you. What I mean by that is the good news, Christ doing the work versus you doing the work. You are empowered to fail every time you leave it up to you. You really are. You really are. The gospel, what we see here is Paul, empowered by Christ, saying that the good news is the standard. The good news, what he preached, the good news is the standard for the gospel. Anyone who preaches, anyone who ministers, anyone who is in the ministry, they can only measure what they do by what Paul taught. Because that's the good news. The good news is Christ redeeming us. Okay? The good news is Him making us righteous. Him doing all, Him, the finished works. That's the good news. There's a lot of things we can get into. You know, we trust God for healing. We trust God for a lot of different things. But the good news is what Paul says that everybody has to be measured by. Everyone. Every message has to be stacked up and lined up against what Paul taught. Every message. That's what he says here. That's what he's saying. So, so what we want to look at today quickly um, is this is a message that's going to go on. Pastor Larry is probably going to minister next week. I'm going to try to get, get the week after because there are several different stages to this. Um, but what we want to look at is giving according to what Paul preached. We're going to start off after a few little things, a few little quotes I have to say that I wrote down here. We'll start off with one verse that Jesus said. But what we want to focus on through this message, however long it takes, is what Paul said about giving. What did Paul teach about giving? What did Paul teach? Not what Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 said. Listen, uh, I got into an argument this week um, from one of our, uh, from one, a person who used to come to church with us uh, over a post I made that if, you're, if your church is using a chapter, and I hate to, I sound like Pastor Larry. Uh, <laughs> God, but it, and, it, and it's kind of scary, um, but I said, if, you're, if your church uses this verse to get you to give, it's, you may want to look at it because it's wrong. You know, it's wrong. They're telling you if you don't give, you know, you're going to be cursed. You're going to be, you're, you know, you're, this is going to happen to you. You're not going to have this. You're not going to have that. And some of the ways, it, some of the way, some of that is maybe true. Hold on to that. But it's not God doing it. It's not God. He's redeemed us from all that stuff. So let's, let's just start off. The, the 10%, is that part of the good news? Is that part of the good news? The 10% was before the law, but folks, it is not part of the good news. It's not part of the good news. It's a great starting point for some people, but folks, is it what Paul preached? It isn't what Paul preached. And right there, that, right, that quote right there, that comment right there will stir people up in a church. But it is the Word of God. Yes, it is the sacred Word of God. But it is not the gospel that Paul preached. It is not. It's not the gospel that he preached. And if we must measure our standard to what, what Paul preached, that's not part of it. Now, the Old Testament scriptures are a great reference and a shadow of what Paul and Christ taught us. Always remember, without the gospel of grace, you're empowered, just, you're empowered to fail, literally. You, you, you're empowering yourself to, to, to uh, fail. One of the things that I've noticed 
in, in church. And I used to have the same, uh, the same mindset is that this quote right here is so famous in church. After I pay my bills, I don't have enough to give. How many of you heard that? Have heard that before? How many of you have used that before? How many have used, after I pay my bills, I don't have enough to give? How many have used that before? I have. I have. I've used it. I've used it. I'm, I'm, I'll admit it. We've got a couple people who admit it. Um, and I'm sure that there's maybe others in here that won't admit it. But the bottom line is, when you look at that quote, when you, if I had a chalkboard up here and it said, after I pay my bills, I don't have enough to give. Okay, think about that. After I pay my bills, I don't have enough to give. What, what is wrong with that quote? What, what is wrong with that quote? There's one word in there. Huh? After. After. after after I pay my bills, after, after, you can't, God comes first. God comes first. And the reason why you may not have enough after is because you don't have him first. You know, that was a major hindrance to me. And I, I can remember taking that stand and, and moving forward into him first and what a difference it made in my life. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing transformation of the mind because that's, that's a prevalent mind thought within the body of Christ. I don't have enough money to give after I pay my bills. That mindset is a huge mindset in the body of Christ right now today. It's huge. I'm on a fixed income. Don't you know that God can take your fixed income and just do something with it? He can do something with it, but you have to do it by his principle, not by your principle. There's a big difference. Salvation is based on God's principle. Salvation is based on God's principle. Giving, receiving is based on God's principle. I, I, I you know, I'm a little... When, when, I, when I hear that mindset, and I hear, I hear it a bunch, there, there's, somebody, there's somebody who's very close to me who uses that mindset a lot. And I thought, I can't even talk to them about it because they, they don't understand. And they would be condemned if you said that. But I can say it here. And on the video, whoever's watching, maybe that touches somebody. you know. But that, that mindset is so prevalent in the church today. Yes, absolutely, 100% self-centeredness. You know, uh, the, the, the Revelations, Revelations, okay, 12.10. Uh, uh, this verse is not up here. We overcome by the blood of Christ, right, the word of our testimony, and not being self-centered pretty much is what it says. If you paraphrase it, it says not loving our lives to the death. It's... Don't be so self-centered. Don't be so self-centered. That right there, self-centeredness in your finances, in, in anything that you do, can be a huge hindrance to you and me. It's very easy to be self-consumed. Very easy. It's easy to be self-consumed. It is for me. Here's another Here's another prevalent mindset in our church. And not our church, I mean in the church. In, in the body of Christ, even outside of the body of Christ, even at the Walmart, to a large majority of Christian people, they say they're poor. They don't have enough to give. I ran into two of these people this week. I'm poor and I don't have enough to give. So here's the question, are you really poor? Or are you just like to think that you're poor? Are you really poor? And in our, in our society today, you know, here are some questions that you can ask yourself if you deal with that mindset because it's okay to, to have that mindset as long as you know you have it and you're willing to deal with it. 
okay? Do you have any type of income? Do you have a home? Do you have a car? <laughs> Do you have a bank account? Do you have a mortgage? Whether you, that's a trick question, whether you answer yes or no on that one. Let me tell you, if you have a mortgage, banks don't give mortgages to poor people, okay? If you don't have a mortgage and you're paying rent, you're not poor. You're not poor. And, 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 and the mindset of people that say, I'm poor, they have two cars sitting in the driveway. Come on, come on, that's a little bit selfish. And, and, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with two cars sitting in a driveway. There's nothing wrong with that. But you I'm just going to go on. I'm going to keep my mind out of and my opinion out of that. Uh, if, you know, if you are poor, if you are suffering, God can get you out of that despair. I don't know any poor people hardly. I really don't. And I know people who say they're poor. I, re I do. Does anybody in here know anybody that says they're poor? Are they poor? My grandfather taught me a long time ago, the one who cries the most has the most. The one who cries the most has the most. And that's pretty much a truth. Uh, when you talk to people about giving sometimes, they say Jesus is not really... Jesus wasn't concerned with our giving. How many of you have ever heard that Jesus really wasn't concerned with our giving? You? I have. I've heard it several different times. So let's, let's just look at what Jesus says about our giving, okay? Let's look at what Jesus did with giving. Uh, Mark 12. And I want you to go look at this. If you have a Bible, well, you can look at it on the board. I, I, I like this right here. And I just want to point out a few things. Remember, this is only to get us to think. And it's to get us to grow. And it's to maybe uh, enlighten us into some areas. It's not, this is not to uh, bring condemnation on anybody. None of that stuff. It's to help us grow. It, it, and and any, everybody in here, um, even Jim, he can grow. We can all grow a little bit. I mean, you know, we're always growing in Christ. So let's look at this verse right here. I think that this is one of the funniest verses in the Gospels. So look at Jesus here. Now, in some churches, they bring their offerings up. Have y'all ever been to a church like that? Okay. Look where Jesus is sitting. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Is Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever? So you think Jesus is concerned about what we're giving and what we're receiving? I think so. And right here, he, he publicly sits down at the collection box. Boy, how many, do you, how many of you know if Jesus was sitting up here and we had a box, boy, it would be the biggest offering we had all year long. Folks would be dropping car keys in there, jewelry, you know, everything that they had. But look at, look at what happens here. Jesus watched as the crowds dropped in their money. So we're not talking about, see, here's, here's another thing that people will say. Well, I don't have a lot of money, but I'm tithing my time. I'm tithing, I tithe my worship. I heard some of these this week, okay? Jesus is talking about money here, and that's what I'm talking about, money. I'm talking about money, straight up money. That's what I'm talking about today. So many rich people put in large amounts. Go on to the next verse. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. Is that it? Okay. And, yeah, let me read it out of, out of here. So, and Jesus said, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, the poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus. But she, 
poor as she was or is, has given everything she had to live on. So there's a lot of messages preached out of this stuff here. There's tons of different ways to minister out of this, at least three or four verses right here. Tons of them. What I want you to see is three, three things out of these verses. And I could minister on, on these from now to the end of, of to 11.30. No problem. What I want you to see is Jesus is concerned. Not, as, not only is he concerned about what you give, but he's also concerned, according to the scripture, not according to me, what you have left over. He's concerned about what you have left over. I, let God reveal that to you. I'm not God. I'm not going to try to reveal that to you. But Jesus is concerned about three things here. He's concerned about, he's concerned about the whole thing in a whole. He's concerned about what you're giving and what you have left over. So ask God for revelation on that because he gave me some, okay? I, and I don't feel, well, let me just say this. We, we put ourselves sometimes in the spot of the lady that gave the two, and we feel like that's all I have. She literally gave out of her everything she had. That was all she had. That was her whole life right there, what she gave. But Jesus talked about the others who, who, who gave out of their abundance, you know. He was concerned about what they had left over also. They gave out of abundance. So that's something to me that I have to remember. How am I giving? And, I, and it's only for me. I'm talking about me. I have to remember how am I giving. Where is it coming from? And I like to keep them things first and foremost on my mind. And I'm going to stop right there. I have some revelations that are personable, personable to me about, this, about these verses right here, but they will not apply to you. And how I know that is because God didn't tell me to share them with you. Um, they will not apply to you. But as we see here, that Jesus was concerned about the giving and the receiving. He was concerned about what? What you give, what you have left over. And he's concerned about the whole thing. And he's watching over it. That's kind of funny that Jesus is watching over the offerings. Let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 12. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly and... Give according to what you have. So here, here's one, one of the very first principles that taught, Paul taught was it proportional giving. So this kind of, it kind of, this is the gospel of grace. So it overrides anything else. Because remember, there's only one gospel. Paul called all the other gospels counterfeit, accursed. Empowered to fail. There's only one gospel. So this kind of overrides the whole 10% thing. He's saying give in proportion to what you have. And yes, everything, and everything is acceptable. Everything. But give in proportion to what you have. That's, that's our number one leading guide when giving in the New Testament. Give in proportion to what you have. Give in proportion. He lays out a couple more other things here. Let, let's read. Uh, let's go. Let's read Second uh, Corinthians eight twelve through twelve through fourteen. Okay. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give eagerly and give according to what you have, not what you don't have. Of course, I don't mean your giving should make life easier for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. Right now, you have plenty and can help those who are in need. Later, they will have plenty and can share with you when you need it. In this way, things will be equal. I've got a lot of comments on that, but I'm, not, I'm going to keep them to myself. Because this is stuff that is, is an individual, um, the gospel minister, ministers to each and every one of us individually. And I tell you, it's so important 
that we receive revelation from the Holy Spirit on these things and not trust in what a man has to say. That's why it's just nice to see the word, take the word, put it in your mind, roll it over and over, and let God reveal to you what he wants you to do. What he wants you to do is not going to be the same as what he wants me to do. It really isn't. It's going to be proportional to what you have. It's going to be in your stage of growth. What he, what he does with Ted and Jenny is going to be completely different than what he does with me or Marsha or Jim or Shannon or Donna and Mike. It's going to be completely different. It'll all have the same kind of spin to it. It'll all be God and Holy Spirit ordained, but it's going to be a little different for each and every one of us. Okay, not only this, let's go to 1 Corinthians 16 too. Not only this, this is, what, this is what, where I think the churches have kind of maybe missed it a little bit. Um, let's read this. On the first day of each week, you should put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Now, he's talking about money again. He's not talking about tithing your time. He's not talking about giving your praise and worship as an offering. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about your money. So he says, take some time, put it aside, money that you've earned, don't wait until I get there, and then try to collect it all at once. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Right. Absolutely. So one of the things that you can take out of this is plan on giving. Listen, when we come into church once sometimes, and I, I watch up here, uh, and, and I'm guilty of it too a lot of times. But from today forward, I'm going to try to do a couple of things. When we come to church, okay, it's time to get our offering ready. Well, everybody scrambles. Okay? And, you know, are we today? Uh, before you got to church, did we take time to think? Did we take time to ask God? Did we take time not so much to ask God, but ask ourselves? Because he's talking about giving proportion to the money that you earned. So, yes, God knows how much money you earned, but so do you. You know how much money you earned. I guarantee you, everybody in here knows how much money they earned this week. They know. He's leaving this up to you. This part of it is up to you. You purpose in your heart before you come to church. He said, set aside. Purpose in your heart. Plan on giving. Lay it aside. Store it up so you'll be ready. This is a totally different mindset than we see in a lot of churches. It really is. Let's take some time to be favorable to ourselves in this area. Let's not harm ourselves in this area. Listen, it's our responsibility. God's not going to do this for us. Oh, yeah, we're under grace, and it's all done. But let me tell you something. You still got some responsibility there, baby, and he's laying it out for you. He's showing it to you. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. This is what Paul said. This is the gospel. It's interchangeable. He calls it the good news, gospel of grace. It's the same thing. It is the gospel right here. This is the good news. Not Genesis. This is the good news. The good news is what Paul preached. Yeah, there's good news in what Christ did. There's good news. But Paul is referring to what he preached. He's not talking about what Jesus preached. He's talking about what he preached. And he was empowered by the Holy Spirit to have authority to say this. And it made it into the book. Okay? So I don't know about you. I believe it. And I'm going to take it for what it's worth. Because I don't want to, I've, believe me, I empowered myself to fail most of my life. I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to do that. And here it's laid out clearly for me, and it says twice, twice, he says, let that man be accursed. You know, and you can, you can get all carried away, and you can get all religious about that. Okay? You really can. But you, yourself, and I, all, we all know that 
by ourselves and by our own effort, we always seem to fall short. We always fall short in that area. Listen, don't empower yourself to fail. Focus on what God says. Don't go back. Listen, don't go back here. Stay with what Paul says. It's real simple. The gospel that Paul preached is from here to, he to here. Okay? It's from here to here. Look at it. See, there's tons of stuff in there about money. I don't want to be empowered to fail anymore. Listen, I know Jesus is coming soon, but I don't want to be broke when he gets here. I don't want to be. You can. That's your God-given right. Let's go on to uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 6. And we've been wearing this verse out around here. Every time I've been up here giving, up these, giving out these faith promise envelopes, which are right here, by the way, Pastor Larry will kill me if I don't talk about these faith promise envelopes, don't you know? Huh? Okay, well, they're here if anybody feels to, to take a faith promise envelope. See, I said it. Uh, so 2 Corinthians 9 and 6. You can, we can go on. I'm going to read this all the way through to verse 15, and then that'll be, we'll close it out. But I want to just show you, there's really only one thing I want you to see here. And I, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say this before around here. But, but let's just read it. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But to one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Let's stop right there for a second. You know what, you know what Paul just said right there? He, he's using the analogy of a farmer. He's using that because we can all understand that. And especially back at this time, they really understood what this meant. This was really, really, really uh, an easy way for Paul to say, listen, this is how it works, and it was easy for them. But you know what Paul is really saying right here? He said, you have authority over your finances. That's what he's saying. He says that you have authority over your increase. Give a little, get a little. Give a lot get a lot. Give zero, get zero. That's what he's saying here. He, has tell, he is telling us right here that we have authority over our finances. We do. Nobody else has authority. God doesn't have authority over your finances. Oh, it all belongs to God, brother, but God has given that authority to you. Not just the authority to receive eternal life, to receive healing, to receive deliverance, but also over your finances. He has given you authority in this area. It's yours. This is the good news. This is the gospel that Paul preached right here. This is not an accursed verse. This is a prosperous verse. This is the verse that tells you you have authority over your finances. You do. God doesn't. God doesn't make you get up and go to work every day. Does he? Your bills probably have a lot to do with that. And you know, the gospel, the good news says that our job is forgiving. I'm, getting a little, I'm taking a side note here. It says our job is forgiving. Well, so here you go. You come home at the end of the week and you look at what you got. And it ain't enough. Well, let me tell you what that pile is. That pile's for your giving. That's your giving. That's your giving. When it's not enough, that's your giving pile. That's, not, that's, that's what that is. That's your seed to sow. When it's not enough, you sow. That's what do. That's what we do. We're farmers. We sow seed. You know, remember we talked about last week, Larry and Corinne have been a living example to us that they have made their living by their giving. We may not like that sometimes. We've all probably said little comments about preachers and money and this and that, but we ain't said nothing about Walmart down there trying to get your money. Ain't nobody ever said, all Walmart wants is their, your money. No, but they doggone sure run around talking about all the preacher wants is your money. But they ain't never said nothing about the gas station. All the gas station wants is your money. That's the truth. Have you ever heard that before? You've got to remember what's going on in the spiritual realm. You have good and evil. Oh yeah, it's finished. 
Satan fell. You have a responsibility in this earth to take a stand for your finances, for your healing, for your deliverance. You have us take a stand for some of that stuff. Larry took a stand. He took a stand on some of that stuff. He did it in a way the Holy Spirit led him. That's what we do. We have directions right here. You have authority over your finances. How many people know that today you have authority over your finances? Did you, is that the first time you've heard that? Because I didn't, I never heard it here before. I've never heard that I had authority over my finances. I never heard that. Yeah, I can see that it says if I give a little, you know, I can see that. But I have authority. I have God-given authority over my finances. No matter how they come in, I have authority over my finances. All right, I'm going to keep reading. Uh, go to the next verse, Chris. You're yeah, going to get moving. You must each decide in your heart. Here it is again. This is the gospel of grace. You must, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. You know why? You know why? Don't give in response to pressure. You know why? Because that goes against the good news. How can you joyfully give in response of pressure? You can't do it. If somebody's pressuring you to give, you can't do it joyfully. You're just not going to be able to do it. I don't care who you are. I don't care how much grace you walk in. You're not going to do it. You're going to have bad feel feelings, ill feelings, a little, uh, a little discontent. You, you, you know, don't do it. Here's some plans for your giving. Not in Genesis. Not in Malachi, in what Paul preached, the good news. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. In other words, you go into church and they're pressuring you to give, put your envelope back in your pocket. It is not going to do you any good. It won't do you any good. If you're being pressured to give, keep it. Roll on to the next place. Give it to somebody who needs it and give it joyfully. Don't give under pressure. Don't do it. Just don't do it, folks. Don't do it. It's not beneficial for you. It is not. It may be beneficial for the other person. And if you want to do it, that's up to you. It really is up to you. It's your decision. You have authority over your finances. But if you're under pressure, you see what Paul said. You see what he said. I didn't say it. He's saying it. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously, generously provide all your need. Then you always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. How many of you are in that position? Don't raise your hands. That's a question you can ask yourself and answer it yourself too. Because if this is not working, something's wrong. And guess what? It ain't God. It ain't God. So Paul's giving us some, some instructions right here. And I have to look at this. Why? Because I'm a Christian. I'm a new creation, and I live by the good news. So this is my direction. And if it's not working, I have to readjust. readjust. I have to be like the GPS that says recalculating, recalculating, recalculating. It's okay to recalculate. It's okay. God's got a plan. Get with it. Let's go to the next verse. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer. King James, God provides seed to the sower. Here's Joe's, here's Joe's little take on that. So does God provide seed to a person who doesn't sow? That's... That's, I mean, God provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Where's the multiplication in this verse right here? It's on your resources, not on your food, not on your bread, not on any of that, okay? Remember, there's a difference here. You have to look at this stuff. 
your resources will be increased if you follow this, this pattern, this New Testament, this New Covenant, this good news on giving. So go ahead to the next. Yes, you will be enriched in every way. That's, that's like a promise. You follow this, and yeah, you'll be enriched in every way. And guess what? It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal to God. This is not a big deal. We make it a big deal. You know why Jesus sat by that box? You know why he sat there? He knew. He absolutely knew that money would be the one thing that, as human beings, that we would tend to trust more than him. He absolutely knew that. That's why we have the good news. That's why we have a man here who brings us a, it's a, I mean, it is such a plan. Listen, this plan, this plan, I'm going to go, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this. This plan for your, for your wealth and well-being and your abundance is laid out more clear than the plan of salvation. Think about that. Think about that. The plan of salvation is pretty clear, okay? But it's, there, there's a lot more time spent on your finances. In these, in these couple of, I mean, there's, Paul spends all kinds of time on, on this. All kinds of time. Your salvation is the most important thing. Trust me, it is the most important thing. But God wants us to live. There is not a prosperity gospel, folks. There isn't. There's not a healing gospel. Despite There's not a faith gospel. There's only one gospel. This is it. There's only one. Every other gospel is a counterfeit to this. It's a, it's a, it's a runoff. It's a one-off. <laughs> it's a two-off. Whatever it is, but it's a counterfeit. This is the gospel. This is the gospel, and there, there is, there's tons of stuff about this. Okay, let's go to the next one. So two things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of believers in Jerusalem or in Inverness will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. <laughs> go to the next one. As a result of your ministry, your ministry, your ministry of giving, they will... They will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Is that it? There's one more verse, but I'll read it from here. Okay. Thank God for this gift. Too wonderful for words. Thank God for this gift, y'all. Thank God for this gift. You know, salvation is a, is a, uh, I hope nobody took what I said the wrong way about more, more being said about finances and stuff. Then, then the plan is really clear. Uh, and, and salvation is clear too. It's a clear plan too. But there's a lot to be said about your finances here. God knew from the beginning of the, the world that we as human beings, as we would grow and we would, you know, multiply in all the things that we have done here, all the technology and everything, that we would be reluctant to lean on him and more apt to trust in our money in this time, in this age. And it has been going on ever since this good news was preached. He knew that, okay? He's laid out a plan for us to be prosperous. The gospel says that Christ died to make you rich. You take that however you want it, but it's rich in all areas. It's not just, you know, when you look at, gra at a graph, you know, it's pied off in different sections. Rich in all areas, not just in salvation, not just in healing, not just in finances, not just in deliverance, not just in generosity, not just in joy. It's all areas. He wants you to be rich in all these areas. And, you know, we, we all have a great gift of generosity. It's the gift of Christ. Christ was the most generous thing ever poured out. 
God gave us Christ. God gave us Christ. The most generous thing there was. Look, Christ knew long before you and I came about what it was going to be like for us. He knew that it would take a covenant agreement with him to, you, to do these things. You know, today if you're on the internet and you don't have an agreement with the Lord, if you don't have a covenant agreement with him, it's easy. You receive him by faith into your heart. It's an agreement that you just say yes to and he has done all the work. He's done everything for you. And how, how do you understand that? You may Because it doesn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense to me when somebody told me that. You just trust. Money is a trust issue. That's what the whole thing is. It's a trust issue. Money is a trust issue. Giving money is a trust issue. That's what it is. As we move forward in this, you're going to see more of that. There's, there's, there's so much talked about in, when it comes to finances in the good news and about trust. And we're going to see some of that as we move forward. So today, Father... We thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the good news, the gospel. We thank you, Lord, that, is, that it works in our lives individually and corporately. Father, we thank you that there is no power in the earth greater than the good news of Christ. There's no power greater. And Father, we thank you that individually you inhabit each and every one of us. The same power that rose Christ from the dead dwells in us today. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that we receive wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of your will for our lives. Father, we thank you. We just thank you, Lord, for the words that you have given us, for the plan that you have laid out for our lives. We thank you for that, Father. We thank you most of all today, Lord, for unconditional love and understanding Father, I thank you right now. Right now, if there's anybody on the internet who's made their life a mess, I'll just say this to you. Christ is standing at, it, at the door with an apron, a mop bucket, and cleaning supplies. All you got to do is open the door, let him in, he'll clean the mess up. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for cleaning the mess up in our lives and continually working on us, Lord, always having faith in us. Father, I thank you that you have great faith in us today, and it's in Jesus' name, amen.